Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the last uh, talking session of the day. We're having a Q&A panel um, topic, uh, what's next for Privacy in Web3. Um, I'm Rich, I'm uh, from the Hopper Project, um, but I'm going to be the neutral moderator representing the LPA here. Uh, and uh, with me we have uh, Dr. Federica Ernst from uh, Gnosis and the uh, amazing uh, Epicenter podcast. Uh, Althea Allen um, from the uh, Ethereum Foundation uh, Privacy and Scaling Explorations team, who talked earlier, and uh, Dr. Issa Sakaya from the uh, Silent Protocol, he's the CTO. Uh, so I thought we'd start just by uh, having everyone introduce themselves uh, and their project and uh, how it sort of contributes to Web3 privacy, and then uh, we'll see where the discussion takes us. Mm -hmm. so let's just move along the line. Yeah, I'm Friederike, you know who I am because I just gave <laughs> the last talk. Um, <laughs> I am one of the founders of Gnosis, so we have built lots of infrastructure over the years. We've been around forever in blockchain terms, um, and we have built infrastructure that kind of centers around the values of self-sovereignty and agent giving back agency to people and privacy. Um, yeah. Hi, Adam. I'm Althea. You might remember me from talking a little while ago. <laughs> uh, I've been working on the privacy and scaling and scoring scheme at the Foundation. We, uh, we're working on a lot of different things in a lot of different ways, obviously, but we kind of focus mostly around uh, that zero knowledge and, and sort of the full stack uh, from cryptographic research and building protocols and tooling uh, and stuff that's more targeted for developers, and then also um, like proof concepts and actual end user applications to try and see this stuff in use. Um, so we're sort of Part privacy, part scaling. I have my privacy hat on today, and I I do communications for that team. So working particularly closely with the designers on the team, we just think a lot about how to kind of uh, help people understand uh, the stuff they're working on, the power of it, the like benefits and risks of privacy technology. Um, hi, I'm Lisa. Uh, I'm actually. Uh, so I'm a cryptographer for over 20 years. Uh, before joining the Sign Protocol, I was a chief researcher in the Turkish National Research Institute of India. Uh, and my main duty was depending on analyze, designing and analyzing uh, cryptographic protocols, including price enhancing protocols. And in 2016, we have co founded the Blockchain Research Lab in that. And worked on self-serving based identity and central and digital currency projects. And last year we have joined with NOAA to produce silent protocol as well. It is kind of an idea uh, that behaves as a middleware on public chains so that users can interact with the decentralized applications in a price preserving manner. Thank you. Um, so I think to start I'm interested in your assessment of the state of privacy sort of right now and maybe what improvements we've seen over the past few years. Like if I was someone who had, you know, I got into crypto, I left because I got Mt. Goxed and now I've just come back, um, you know, how would you say that my experience as a, as, a, as a user would have changed and improved or not improved from a, from a privacy perspective? And uh, yeah, and, and what, what particular projects maybe have, have um, helped to contribute to that, or technologies. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think your experience would be much different than it was in 2012 or whenever you got among Gox, but uh, um, just because there are a plethora of tools now, and a lot of them are not privacy preserving, right? Basically, back in the day, you would have had to do a lot more yourself, um, and basically running nodes was also um, less difficult, uh, difficult, so more people were doing it. And obviously, a, a, you know, one solution uh, in, the, in that problem space is just running your own node, right? So basically, if you run your own node, you kind of, you forgo a lot of the privacy problems that, that you have otherwise. <clears throat> um, and I think basically in the way that um, Web3 has become commoditized, um, if you, if you just want to build something on Web3 and you use um, Alchemy or Infura or whatever, um, 
it's a lot easier than it was 10 years ago. Um, but it's also, um, you, you have way less sovereignty over your own data. I mean, obviously, if you care, there are solutions for everything, but you actually have to care. Uh, and I think back in the day, um, you didn't have to care. There just weren't any convenient solutions, so you had to do a lot more yourself anyways. Yeah, I think in a way, the, uh, I think, well-intentioned attempts to make crypto more user-friendly have actually been kind of a backslide for privacy, uh, because they just adopt some of the like, assumptions and habits of Web2. <laughs> uh, and they not only sort of like, obscure exactly what's going on, but sort of discourage us from paying attention. They let us forget what whatever it is, like, what information we're giving away, or um, or just that everything on a blockchain is completely public all the time <laughs> uh, by sort of abstracting and sometimes we are actually sort of from sort of questioning or, or paying attention. Um, I do have to give sort of a like shout out for zero knowledge groups for having come, I think, a really long way in the last couple of years. I think there's just an explosion of really cool like um, like optimizations of the actual primitives and like new ideas and protocols and new tools being created with the intention of uh, like making privacy more accessible and making it easier to have privacy be a default and to have it be somewhat invisible instead of this laborious thing that you have to go out of your way to have. And it's partly the work of like making those things available, but I think also of sort of taking away the excuse for not building privacy into everything. Like, if you can no longer say it's harder to do, then you have no excuse for not doing it. So I think that, for me, is part of what's exciting, is that like, the easier it gets, the easier it is to call people out on, like, why, why are you really building things the way that you're building if you have another way to make privacy possible? So from the technical point of view, I think that everybody has already been mentioned. So the technology is moving very fast. So we will be seeing different solutions, much more efficient solutions in the near future, of course. But uh, in parallel to this, we also need to kind of uh, pursue the goal to increase the awareness level, privacy awareness level in the user spaces, because so currently, what we what we also promising is that rewriting some definitions already uh, known applications in much more user friendly, much more decentralized way. But in the meantime, now we have the power to also integrate privacy as a by design feature, not just an error. Because previously in Web2 space, of course, there was a deliberate uh, strategy to remove it from the stack not just because of the functionalities, but also just it was kind of keep under the rules behind the curtain so that users do not ask for it. So now we also, by just organizing these type of events, we can kind of increase the awareness from the user side so that they can clearly see the difference and the rights they have. And the users need to require their features, these features, so that the as developers, when we build something, they can see, they can try, and in this way, we can create the need and the usage of the privacy preserved solutions in a much more user friendly way. So, this is kind of the same thing, yeah, I'm just taking a little bit Maybe you remember uh, the small events in the closed areas. Yeah. At first, there were some regulations. But no, no one was able to uh, just cut in punishment for them. And the smoking people were saying that, okay, I can smoke, do this, do that. But after five years or after ten years, now we already accepted that smoking in this salon or in a building, in a closed environment, is naturally should be banned. So it took time, and here uh, it's probable that again we will face some the same struggle. So, we need to increase the social awareness so that our technology can be used in much more faster way or adapted in much more faster way. You think 
uh, it will, we're talking about the same sort of order of timeline. Do you think things will be as slow as that for as five, ten years for adoption? I think we are in a much more good position right now. Because, so the funny story is that the final work on digital currency uh, came from Dave Chow, who mentions the main problem is the price of the solution at the 1980s. So it took over 30 years. And there were lots of borders, both in the Web2 space and now in the Web3 space. So all of these occurrences have some effects. So that is why we are, of course, in a much more better uh, acceleration point right now. But we also developers should uh, push this acceleration into higher range so that we can get production in a much more faster way. A question, I think, mostly to Althea, based on your talk earlier, but um, obviously for everyone. The, you mentioned uh, zero knowledge proofs, and you know, I started off in a project that was very zero knowledge based, and sort of four or five years ago, the only use case that anyone ever used was like proof of age. They did the same, you know, you have to go into a bar, you want to prove that you're over 18 without having to share your actual birth date. And you know, now there are a lot more we see a lot more examples, a lot more use cases. The ZK Bob um, talk we saw if, on their Know Your Cat category page, you know, there's examples of lots of things that, that can be, you can prove with zero knowledge proofs. But I wonder how that ties in with your idea that maybe things are too, there are too, many, too much reliance on metrics and numbers and parameters. And, and you, know, you, you sketched out a view of privacy which wasn't maybe very compatible with how we live online. But a lot of how crypto works it does have to operate on incentives and parameters and metrics because that's all that you can measure. And you know, do you feel like the solution is to just keep going in this way with more and more granular approaches, or do we need to take a slightly different tack? That's, that's really interesting you bring that up. I feel like I just had this conversation like two hours ago where this topic came up that, like, yeah, I don't care anything about it. We have to measure everything and everything's about incentives. That's totally blocking. Like that's the whole like foundation of the entire idea is that you like it works because you incentivize it. And I don't I don't think that I'm trying to kind of argue against quantifying anything. I think I'm trying to argue against quantifying everything. That like there are things that you should count, like money. You don't want to make money qualitative, like that doesn't make any sense, right? Like there it's not that incentives aren't logical, it's that we try to kind of, I think, granularly um, like measure and quantify qualitative aspects of human beings and the fabric of our society. <laughs> and I think our psychology to kind of think of ourselves in those ways. So it's it's not uh, it's not a choice between like measuring and not. It's just choosing what is like productive or useful to measure and incentivize and choosing what things should be more free and sort of you know maybe egoless or maybe not incentivized the things that are like uh, have meaning only when they uh, remain qualitative if that makes sense. It does. I it just I I felt like there's quite an overlap between what is not what is abstract and vague and not quantitative and what you might want to keep private. I feel like there is actually, in that sphere, there is a lot of stuff that you might want to keep private which you actually can't, which is very abstract and you can't define, you can't say necessarily why you want to keep it private, you just know that you do. And there I feel like we might have trouble making, it's gonna be a challenge to make um, technologies which are compliant with that approach. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on there was, com was compliance regulation, and that's come up in a lot of talks. Um, it, it seems like everyone agrees that it is sort of builders' jobs to provide tools and options for people to, to build compliant um, tooling, and it's not up to users necessarily to, to, to stay, to be fully in charge of how they're saying compliant. I mean, it, ultimately it's their responsibility, but there needs to be options and ways and choices. Um, I'm interested in how that interacts with sort of staying neutral. A lot of uh, the projects that we've, we've seen have talked about ways to build things that are compliant with regulations, such as OFAC sanctions lists, and um, you know, so you can have private financial things on, on Tornado while also being 
compliant with the list, but is it our job to put, is there an ethical component to should we push back against these lists? Should we just naturally agree with regulators that uh, what they want is what we, should, what we should provide for? Do builders, should we just stick neutral tools out there and then see what, what, is, what, is, what comes out? Or, or is there a, a moral obligation to build a particular kind of thing for a particular kind of Web3 that we want? If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whom, whom? Any, anyone? Anyone who? I, I think there's um, uh, there are different layers here, right? So basically, um, if you if you, I think there should be regulation. And you say the regulators, if there's only one regulator. I mean, obviously, kind of there's uh, there's an almost infinite number of regulators who all want slightly different things. Um, so I think kind of there is a layer on which um, the protocol should just be allowed to be um, neutral, right? Kind of like if you have an optical fiber network, you would never put it on the fiber to kind of police what content it lets through, right? So this is a naughty bit, don't let this bit through kind of thing. So um, I think there is, um, and I think there have been um, attempts to kind of regulate at this very base layer. And I think this is something that we all need to push back against really hard. And then I think there is an application layer where um, kind of the builders of the applications kind of have to um, navigate this regulatory space and that may be subject to regulation. But I think kind of pushing back on A, on the very uh, you know basic fundamental um, structures underlying all of this um, and pushing back and saying this is not something that should be censored in any way at all. Um, I think this is, this is super important. And then also kind of um, making privacy um, something that we fight for, right? Because if you look at like the development over the last say 30 or 40 years, I mean, back in the day, you had a bank account, and uh, you, well, sure, your bank kind of knew um, how much uh, uh, funds you had, and you know where you kind of, you know, uh, where you, where you withdrew money. But by and large, most of the interactions you would have had 40 years ago, you know, buying a coffee and kind of buying a newspaper, whatever, all of that would have been private. And I think this is something that has slowly eroded over time. The fact that basically we now use e-money all the time and basically all of that data is there and searchable and is sold. <laughs> I mean, people actually do analyses on your transaction data, I mean, not with your name attached to it because that would be an ethical breach, but basically on the entire treasure tro tro trove, that is, data is being extracted from that. And I don't think, um, that should be, I think it should be, you should have to be made aware of this and you should also be compensated for that if that is to happen, right? So um, I think kind of claiming back privacy as a human right and not something that kind of like where people say, I have nothing to hide, so I have nothing to worry about. I don't care if anyone sees me naked, I don't care. It's like I have all the regular bits. It's, I, I, I think this is wrong. I think this is something where we kind of have to fight for the narrative. I'm not sure, I'm not sure this, is, uh, this is a battle we'll win, but it's a battle we have to fight. I suppose I, you know, in my purple shirt, I wonder if, if you think there's any particular role for uh, sort of advocacy groups like the LPA uh, as a sort of separation from the builders. You know, the LPA is, a, is, a, is a, a conglomeration of builders who, you know, the builders themselves might be neutral, but then perhaps the activist group can. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that provides clarity or, or, or muddies the waters to have these. Yeah, I think there's, I think people's skill sets vary, vary, right? So basically some people are very good at lobbying, kind of making the same point over and over again to to, to various people, and some people really hate it. And I think there tends, there tends to not be that much overlap, and I think that's fair. But um, I, I think the only way to kind of really um, take back the topic is by um, claiming back privacy as the default, 
um, because basically as soon as you make it hard for things to be private, you normalize things not being private, and then the people who will pay for privacy are the people who want it most, for, for whom it is the most economically beneficial. And yes, then you'll end up in a tornado pool with like 30% from North Korean hackers. No one wants to help. I don't want to help North Korean hackers. I don't like North Korean hackers. This is horrible. Like, I don't want to condone this. I don't want to enable this. But I think the only way we can kind of move beyond that point is by um, making um, everything private, by kind of making privacy the, the default option and kind of, and then basically if the, Korean, uh, the North Korean hackers have like 0.1%, whatever, that, that happens in, you know, in, in the regular money system as well. Um, and I think this is something that regulators will look past because they look past it in every other venue as well. And uh, yeah, so I think this is, this is kind of uh, the road we kind of have to embark on, kind of making privacy the default and no more, and thereby kind of making private transactions by and large completely harmless. Do you feel Web3 has the clout to make those arguments when we see that, I mean, I bring this up because, you know, I'm from the UK, and at the moment we have the online safety bill, which, which you know, WhatsApp and Signal are pushing back strongly against, I mean, that's to try and stop end-to-end -end encryption in the name of child safety. Um, but you know, WhatsApp and Signal have the clout to make the government uh, you know, push back on, or our, my government push back and push back legislation and reconsider it. Do we in Web3 have that power, or do we have to take other approaches? In the past, it's always been that we would build it and deal with the, pro the problem later because it was unstoppable. Um, Is that not true anymore? Uh, I agree. <laughs> I, I would, my kind of instinctive response to that was like, do we have to have the club if we actually, and I think this is why, like you were saying, it's so important that at the protocol level, this stuff be, like, the privacy be baked in. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was David Graeber, I'm going to just, like, terribly butcher a quote, something about activism being the radical act of behaving as if you're already free. So you just build the thing in the way that it should be built. And if you do that, then you build in the same protections that will keep people from finding out that it was you that did it. <laughs> uh, make it much harder for people to come after you for doing something that might piss somebody else off, but that is sort of in line with your own morals. And I, I think it's really important uh, for something that, like, is acting as a, a source of shared truth that it not contain the ethics of some particular group in some particular moment in time, like in the way that the state or government is sort of at the application level of social protocols. That's where those kinds of things should be built into the like into this stack as well. I think the protocol. There's no such thing as neutral technology like that. That's not a real concept as far as I'm concerned. But you don't have to intentionally build in laws, and especially ones that you kind of don't maybe agree with. <laughs> or it's certainly that not everyone involved agrees on. Like if it's not the sort of collective will of every person using it, then I don't know what the excuse would be for, for building that stuff in at the protocol level, or not actively building that stuff out of the protocol level so that people have like Frederick was saying, like the tools and the ability to comply, but that compliance to some particular regime or like some particular moral framework is not built in at that like base layer of like shared foundational truth. Uh, so from my point of view, uh, I can say this one. So we as humans have some moral dignity. We know what is bad and what's, what is good. So based on moral point of view, we can of course adopt the technology in this way. But the issue that comes to the play is that after this point, once some knowledge has, can be gathered, so the intelligent agencies just look for more. The fight begins there. So how much more is the question? And that is why we should, again, uh, by utilizing some sort of uh, the technologies or primitives that we've already been building on, 
we should provide the moral dignity at some point. That should be the base point. And, and that should be the final point in the end. Because otherwise, what happens is that someone has some secret key, someone has some logs of every activity, and whenever some entity wants to or pays for it, they actually get it. That is what we what's happening right now in the crypto space and for almost every services. Because all of those free services, the, their basic business model relies on the information that can be extracted from the user behaviors and then whenever someone needs it, they are just selling for it. Yeah. So that is why we definitely cut the point at the basic level so that we shouldn't be uh, enabling any form of uh, data or vector somehow. Otherwise, it will be just broken by the starting point and it won't be able to, we, won't, we probably won't be able to stop it there. Because this is just a greedy game and the one who gets it always asks for more. We should stop by do you feel, you know, looking forward to the next two, three, five years, that the privacy battleground is going to stay the same? Is there something on the horizon you, you know, you worry that we aren't addressing yet that we need to address, um, or is it going to be, you know, increasingly drilling, drilling deeper down into the things that we're talking about now: compliance and you know, credible neutrality and account abstraction, these sorts of technologies, or is, is, is it going to be a never-ending? <laughs> Will something new always come up? Um, from my point of view, I believe that uh, over these years, the Cold War was there, but was not in the public eye, so that most of the people weren't aware of the Cold War. So especially, so before the crypto tokens and the crypto coins, in the cryptography world, this was the main issue. Just within the cryptography, not another thing, and all the researchers was kind of labeled if they are working some intelligence agency or not, if they are just being in the uh, open literature and creating for the open literature case. So uh, that is already that was that has been already happening in the background. Now this is coming to the public view, and I believe this is a good thing because in the end, we human have right to decide the final outcome, not just some regulatory body or some uh, sanctions or that one, because that should be the case, how we define the mechanism. Yeah. So by utilizing this type of power and maintaining this fight, I believe that we will may have some harsh fights in the, mean, in the meantime, but uh, in a very short term, there will be a huge change because by the time most the number of people who got affected because of these type of privacy leakage issues, number is getting higher. But this doesn't matter because in the end, what must matter is that there is one human being who got affected just because of this occurrence. So there is really an intimidating uh, event that happened in 2018. I there was an op-ed uh, published by Washington Post, which was about a woman who had mi miscarriage. So this lady is expecting a baby and searching over web services, some books, some baby materials that they may have on the clothes. And all of the search engines just noticed that all the AI noticed that this certain person is expecting a baby. And after that point, all the ads were pointing out the items that are related with the pregnancy scan. And unfortunately, after the miscarriage, this lady suffers too much. And at one point, she was not able to open the web. So no one or no AI or no corporate or no solution should have this power to some certain specific person. Yeah. That is the main definition that they are mentioning about. So we say that privacy is human right. And this is just 
for everyone, not the, over the community, not over some numbers of the statistics. So that is why uh, these unfortunate events has led us to this point. That is why we have been seeing lots of privacy preserving solutions. Layer zero transport, layer, layer one blockchain, layer two, layer three, layer five, this and that. And that is the kind of as a result of the need that brought us because of these type of events. So we will be having a much more brighter signal. I hope. I hope so too. I'm maybe a little bit less optimistic. <laughs> I I do I wanna like add one thing before we totally gloss over it, which is I feel like we should um, differentiate regulation from morality. I don't think that those are synonyms. Like is OPEC moral is a question, I think. <laughs> like that different people in this room would have different answers to. So I think because I said that thing about like technology can't be neutral and then totally fell into my own trap of thinking that we should like build privacy into it as a human right because I think it is. So I'm um, yeah, I'm like falling into my own trap there. <laughs> but I just wanted to kind of add that to, to that layer of the discussion. But um, I also am, am thinking right now, I guess you're talking about like this particular case, like I think Privacy is like uh, an issue that a lot more people are becoming aware of and like having thoughts about, but that in general, the idea that privacy isn't important or that like it's negotiable uh, or that we don't need to fight for it or that we already have it, I think in general that argument comes from a position of real privilege of it not having happened to you yet and a lot of people are having the moment, whatever it is, their personal moment of waking up to, like, this does affect me. And if not that, maybe starting to see that people that they care about, whether it's like people actually in front of them or some remote, you know, whatever, community overseas, they see ways that people are affected, ways that people's lives are made worse <laughs> by, uh, by this lack, and so I think there's there is like a growing awareness, at least of the like of how complicated the question this is. I don't know how easily we're going to get to answers about it, um, but for me, like conversations about privacy with people who don't think about privacy for a living have gotten a lot more interesting over the last two years than they ever were before. So that's I think that's a good sign that at least people are kind of awake to it and what conclusions they reach, I don't know. And will they be the same as mine? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> but I'm glad that people at least are thinking more correctly about it. I hope that's true because in I don't have that impression. So I think that, I mean, in terms of technology, I am super con uh, confident. I think we can engineer our way out of this, no problem at all. The question to me is, can we make people care? So the real, the real, um, uh, the real kind of question is, how how do we combat the indifference that's kind of snuck in? Um, so people don't care that kind of they get personalized ads, and you know they, you know what, something super funny happened to me. I was talking about something. Um, and my phone was lying on the table and the next day I got an ad for this. And you know, this should freak you out. This is like, wh why do you think this is funny? This is not funny, this is terrifying. And somehow this, this entire thing has lost its, um, has, 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 has lost its scariness to people. people. So I think the real danger is people just stop caring about privacy and kind of, and once this is kind of baked into the societal norms that everything should be out in the open, everyone should be able to see um, what, what everyone else is doing and basically this entire kind of surveillance capitalist infrastructure kind of has been sanctioned by um, the, you know, morality of, of the majority, 
I think this is, this is the real danger. So I think the engineering, we, we, the, we, we've got the engineering. We can engineer our way out of this. But yeah, getting people to care is the difficult part to me. Because there's already many examples where in principle it's easy to do something in a privacy preserving manner, right? So don't have to use Gmail. But how many people here use Gmail? Yeah, there you go. Why? I mean, this is, and the, the question is, I mean, in principle, there are privacy preserving alternatives, right? You don't have to use Gmail. I personally use Gmail too for some things. It's like, you, 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 it's, and I think kind of getting people to a point where they will kind of change their behaviors, somehow that's a lot more tricky than I thought. I do want to say that I generally agree with you. I opened by saying I was not that optimistic, and I'm not on like a mass scale. I think to me, like the problem <laughs> that I see is in individual people, <laughs> and like uh, maybe it's just that I travel more in circles where people are actually like interested in having these conversations. But I do think, like, yeah, on, on a large scale, we are making like terrifyingly blind choices and I think like that's not necessarily moving in the right direction either and I'm just like I'm happy to be able to like have more conversations about what it all means and I'm happy to see people be more like even to make the observation that their phone is listening to them is a start <laughs> but I think yeah the, the, what it's going to take for that to like sink in and be something that people are actually willing to like act on and take a risk for I think that's where most people draw the line it's like well if something weird is going to happen to me then I'm not going to even try I'm just going to like take what's given to me and I don't know what's going to get people over that line I don't, I don't think most people are anywhere near that yet. Yeah, the only thing I would add at this point was that maybe you may remember it, the around 2000s. So at that point, the main uh, point of view was if you have something to hide, then you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. This is the quote coming from previous CEO of Google. So this was kind of reflecting the general idea regarding respect to privacy. But uh, over time, this motor kind of changed into the, okay, yeah, yeah, privacy is human right, but, oh, yeah, I understand that. Okay, let's do it this way. So, okay, everyone has the right to choose. So everyone may choose to have privacy. They should have. So this is kind of the point after that. So now it's evolving into the other phases. Yeah, it's kind of became, of course, the numbers, the statistics doesn't reflect the point that we should be, but when we look at over time to this picture, we can see that it's really evolving in a much more positive way. That is why I said I'm very optimistic on this one. I don't say it may be easier, but still, so that is really hard to say because that was the case. Why, for instance, previous I was working with different companies and institutional companies and were giving some lectures on cryptographic protocols and so on and so forth for some central bodies as well, right? We were also talking about how they should protect the privacy, personal privacy, and the corporation privacy as well. And even there, the people were not aware of that. So it was really, it was really a bad picture because they just said, okay, I'm just a single guy who will do whatever data but this guy is just the CEO of some company and just all the data can be stolen because of him already. So from that point to here, so most of the people and the most of the younger generations as well, so they are born into this and it's much more harder for them to kind of process. At first they want the attention, then they see the other uh, defects of this unbelievably chaotic space. Now they're kind of seeing that, okay, it's maybe a much more better idea if I don't share my data so vigorously, so unfrankly. Yeah. So that is why I was kind of very optimistic on this one. Thank you. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll open up to any questions. From Thank <laughs> you.
No, well, uh, anyway, thank you to the three guests and thank you for attending. And in about 10 minutes, we have the hackathon uh, judging and awards. Thank you. Thank you.